Hello and welcome to Caregivers First, the show brought to you by SCAN, the Social Communities Activities Network, a nonprofit agency dedicated to helping active adults stay informed, empowered, and inspired. I'm Lavelle Jones, AARP New Jersey State President and the host of Caregivers First. I'm so excited about the show we have for you today. When we need a physician, for ourselves or those in our charge, we want the right one for the best treatment. It's important for us to understand the expertise of our medical care providers. So today, we're going to discuss the unique roles of the primary care physician and the medical specialist. We are so fortunate to have as our special guest, Dr. David Hippolyte and Rita McTide nurse practitioner at Beacon of Life PACE program. Dr. David Hippolyte is the medical director for the Beacon of Life PACE program, a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly serving Monmouth County. Dr. Hippolyte is board certified in surgery and obstetrics. From 1995 to 2019, he was in family practice in Red Bank, New Jersey. In October 2019, he joined Beacon of Life. Dr. Hippolyte is on staff at Hackensack Meridians, Bayshore, and Riverview Hospitals. Welcome, Dr. Hippolyte. Thank you. Rita McTie is an APN with the clinical team at Beacon of Life. Rita has been an RN since 1985 working in various hospitals and long-term care facilities in Long Island, New York. She received her BSN at Felician College in Lodi, New Jersey in 2011 and certified as an APN at Monmouth University in Adult Gerontology in 2017. Rita specializes in wound care, oncology, and gerontology. She joined Beacon of Life PACE program in 2019. Welcome to you, Rita. Thank you. So I'm so glad and happy to have both of you as our guests today to talk about this important subject. So Dr. Hippolyte, I'd like to start our program um, by asking you a question. I know that yes. you have 25 years experience as a primary care physician. Yes. Would you explain to us what does the term primary care physician mean? What exactly do primary care physicians do? So as uh, in the old age, uh, old time, the primary care physician takes care of the patient in his entirety of, its, of his or her uh, body or status. And uh, we all really have a compassionate care uh, making sure that everything is working well for the patient. From diagnosis of any kind of illness to treatment to advise the patient and taking care of the patient. I see. Now, are there different categories of primary care physicians? Uh, I, guess, I, I guess, for example, as a primary care physician, do you treat adults and children and older people or there are different kind of primary care uh, provider. Okay. But there's one kind of primary care physician. Either they are internist or they are family physician. So as a primary care provider, so as internist or that, uh, they have a special knowledge or comprehensive knowledge of the body, the whole body. And they, they have clinical experience to take care of the patient. I see. Yes. Okay. So as a primary care physician, um, what types of, I guess, conditions or illnesses would you treat? You say that you focus on the whole body. Yes. So the whole spectrum from head to toe, <laughs> I would say. Okay. Uh, uh, if someone has a headache, I will take care of the patient, make sure that what kind of headaches they have. Mm -hmm. And I will send them for special procedure if they need that. Mm -hmm. so, so I know what I'm dealing with and take care of them. Uh, if they have a problem with their feet, I will take care of that. If they have pain, I will send them for x-ray, for example, mm -hmm. to make sure there's nothing broken. Mm -hmm. Or if they have arthritis, so I know what to do for them. 
I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Rita, let me ask, ask you a question. Um, when a patient goes to see a primary care physician, um, you know, whether it's for the first time or even ongoing, what are some of the things that that patient and doctor should discuss? Well, they definitely should discuss the past history, what kind of diseases have been, they have been treated for in the past. Um, primary care also deals a lot with prevention, so we want to make sure that people are immunized correctly, that they're being screened appropriately, age appropriately for different diseases, diabetes, hypertension, uh, cholesterol problems. Uh, we want to see that they have been following a, a plan to make sure that all these things are being monitored. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. And uh, I'm for my own curiosity, um, when we th think about primary care physicians, what is the training that primary care physicians undergo? Oh, that's a lot of training. Uh, they spend, I didn't do my, my uh, schooling here. I went to Belgium and spent seven years mm -hmm. studying I bought medicine. So it's medical for is it, what is it? Several years of medical school. Medical school and uh, and, and practice and um, clinical uh, experience mm -hmm. to know how to take care of the patient. And I went after that to residency program. I, I was in the VA uh, medical center in Pennsylvania to get my residency uh, there. And from there, so I've been like ten years at least. Okay, so of it's... Of medical knowledge and okay. clinical experience. I, I asked this question because I have always been fascinated and in awe of doctors. And I know oh, that really? it's extensive <laughs> training. So it's Thank medical you. school, it's residency. Yeah. And, um, and I guess that leads me to another question, and that is um, there are physicians who are specialists. Um, what type of, or do they have special training that makes them specialists? versus a primary care physician? Uh, besides uh, uh, going there, like for example for me, I, I went to an internal medicine to have my residency in internal medicine. So that makes me a specialist for internal medicine, I so see. the whole body. But the specialists uh, go beyond that and will go, uh, for example, for the heart uh, to a, a, a a school or university to learn about the heart in depth, in detail. I see. So they become a specialist. So they call them a cardiologist. So if they go for a uh, specialty for kidneys, mm -hmm. they become a nephrologist. Mm -hmm. So they spend maybe two or three more years uh, more learning about that, specific that special organ. I see. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me ask you in your practice. Um, yes. Under what circumstances or what situations would um, cause you to send a patient to a specialist? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> that's uh, require uh, a book <laughs> to read <laughs> to, to write. But basically, I would really uh, not only try to pursue diagnosis and and uh, treatment. But I will do all kind of testing first before sending the patient to the specialist so I know what I'm dealing with. So when those testing come and I cannot, uh, it's beyond my expertise, mm -hmm. I will send them to the specialist to have an answer. I see. A specific uh, advice mm -hmm. and care mm -hmm. what to do next for the, for the patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. But before that point, you go, th you put them, I guess, through a whole series a of whole testing. Of and, and Yes. Okay. And coming from uh, the whole spectrum mm -hmm. of uh, asking them all kind of questions about their background mm -hmm. and what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And so I know what I'm dealing with. The more information you have, this information, the better, because mm -hmm. I help you really pinpoint what the problem is with okay. the patient. That's, that's a very important point. Yes. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing that. And that actually leads me back to something that, that Rita mentioned earlier, and that was screenings. screenings. Um, and I guess um, one thing that, that I think is important for all of us as patients or eventual patients is uh, what type 
of screenings should we always be be getting when we visit our physicians? Um, well, uh, specifically for for primary care physicians, I, I you mentioned a couple of things that I wasn't quite sure what they were. Would you mind walking us through that again? Because sure. I think that's important. I mean, a lot of the testing that we do or the screenings that we do are age are age specific. Okay. Gender specific. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we're monitoring people's. Uh, blood pressure. Um, when we, I care for older adults, so I want to look at things for 65 and older patients. Did they have um, a DEXA scan, which is a bone scan, to check for osteoporosis? Did they have um, their labs drawn? Do we know if they have high, high uh, cholesterol levels? How is their sugar going? Are they having elevated sugar levels? You know, things that we can identify and then treat. Um, then there's all sorts of cancer screenings that we would go through, and again, that would be your mammograms, mm -hmm. your um, the men with the PSA mm -hmm. testing, and things mm -hmm. like that. And it's all there's the guidelines that we follow, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that we're following the guidelines. And to that point, I um, have heard, and I, I see it said often that um, as a patient, we should know our numbers. What does that mean? What numbers are we talking about? Well, we want to know our blood pressure numbers, mm -hmm. we want to know our cholesterol numbers, and mm -hmm. I believe we want to know our sugar numbers. Okay. And our weight. Okay. Weight is very important as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that's very important because you, as a primary care provider, we want to filter and stop the disease before they come. That's what they call prevention. Mm -hmm. So if we take okay. it early okay. enough or we, we, we check and we see something coming, so we can uh, intervene and make, make it stop before it becomes okay. beyond our you know, mm -hmm. expertise and we cannot take care of it anymore. Mm -hmm. So at that time, we are forced to send them to the specialist, I see. for example. So as a primary care physician, uh, you, let's say you would see someone uh, who's a, let's say a, a child and you would be there, for, you could, conceivably be their physician all the way through their adulthood? I would, I would not because uh, being a, a, a child uh, provider would be a specialist. That is a specialist. Uh, that's a pediatrician. A pediatrician. Th that's okay. a different. So okay. I start seeing them from age 18, eight, 18 and beyond that. Okay, and yes. you said you are uh, internal uh, an medicine. internist. Yes. Okay, so you see, uh, because adults, I think this is important information, yes. so you see adults 18 and, 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 older. and older. So for my children, I would seek out a pediatrician. That's correct. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. That's mm -hmm. that's important information. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, let me ask. Uh, you, you talked about uh, the circumstances under which you would recommend someone um, see a specialist. Yes. Are there situations that that you have had where patients themselves have? said, well, I need to see a specialist or I want to go to a specialist. Rita, do you have any Absolutely, all the time, that? yes. All the time, okay. Yeah. People, uh, when they f hear that they have a heart problem or they uh, have uh, elevated cholesterol levels, they think that they need to be followed by a cardiologist. And a cardiologist certainly can see them and give them advice, but we also have the knowledge to do the same advice. Um, we want to send people to the cardiologist when there's a problem that we can't handle. Okay. I mean, and often I will send someone, if they are requesting a cardiologist, we'll do the workup. We'll do the EKG, we'll do an echocardiogram, stress test. And if there's a problem with those, then of course we'll send them. I see. Okay. So it's not unusual for a patient to, to, no, to patients, say that. No, patients. I explained that a lot of time in, okay. my, in my practice before. But I will sit with them and ex explain to them, this is what you have and this is the solution. I have the solution for you. You don't need to see the specialist yet. Okay. So if I cannot handle it, I will send you to the specialist. That's important. That's yes. an important point. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so very yes. much. We are going to take a short break. Um, and when we come back, we will continue our discussion with Dr. David Hippolyte and Rita McTie. You probably already know that rehabilitation is a must for successful recovery from surgery, injury, or serious illness. What you may not know is that you're free to choose where you go for rehab. In Monmouth and Ocean County, the compelling choice is Care One. Where you choose to go for rehab matters, and with Care One, you have four convenient locations to choose from in Monmouth and Ocean Counties. 
Care One at Jackson, Care One at Wall, Care One at Homedale, and Care One at King James in the Atlantic Highlands. At Care One, you'll work with a team of experts to develop a plan based on your needs and goals. You'll have the full support of caring, compassionate physicians, RNs, licensed therapists, and nutritionists dedicated to helping you recover successfully without setbacks at a pace that makes you comfortable and successful in meeting your rehabilitation goals. Once you take the first step with us, you'll never look back. Call 877-99-CARE-1 today and come for a tour. Welcome back to Caregivers First. We're talking to Dr. David Hippolyte and Rita McTie. Doctor, before we went to the break, we yes. talked about uh, primary care physicians and specialists. Yes. And before we move away from the specialist discussion, I'd like to ask you to share with us some common medical specialists. I, I know, you know we had mentioned gerontology. Walk us through some of those specialties, particularly if they are um, relevant to caregivers and the older population. I think due to the fact that uh, in the United States there's a couple of problems with the heart, I think one of the main specialists that's important is the heart specialist that's called cardiologist. A cardiologist. A cardiologist. Uh, and we have other specialists such as the kidney doctor, that's a nephrologist. Or if you have diabetes, a lot of diabetes, sometimes you need to see an endocrinologist. That's for the glands, all the glands in your body. Oh, yes, okay. Like the pancreas is one of them. That's where mm -hmm. the, you secrete the insulin to take care of the mm -hmm. blood sugar. And, and uh, that's an endocrinologist? Endocrinologist, yes. Uh, f and th uh, that specialist would treat conditions like diabetes? Like diabetes. I, I did not know that. Yes, yes. Okay. Or if you have a thyroid problem, the, uh -huh. the small gland mm -hmm. there, there, and they would take care of that also. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know that as, as we get older, we're concerned about our, our bones and our bone density. Yes. Um, what are the specialists who uh, we might see for those conditions? Uh, there is no specific specialist for that. No. There's an uh, area where the primary care provider really should take care of that. Oh, okay. And try to prevent any problem before that happens. Mm -hmm. That's you become osteoporotic mm -hmm. and that's really increase your risk of fracture or if you fall, I something see. like that. I see. At that time, we will check uh, your vitamin D level, your calcium level, and uh, your hormones to make sure that everything is okay. And you will also um, tell the, the patient to try to be active, to exercise. So that's really strengthening the bones. I see. All those things. Okay. We, we work more on prevention, trying to prevent all the problem mm -hmm. happening. Okay, I have to remember it's vitamin D that's yes. for the bones. Yes, oh. yes. Oh, one oh. of the vitamins, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I will remember that. Yes. And Rita, let me ask you, you mentioned that um, actually as part of your training, um, you have experience in gerontology. Talk to us a little bit about what gerontology is and perhaps some of the um, conditions or illnesses that you see in, in uh, patients um, who see a gerontologist. So gerontology is the, the care of people who are over the age of 65. So um, it, nowadays that's pretty young. So thank you. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> they, they, ha, they, you know, so it's as we're aging older, we, we're more susceptible to any disease, uh, diabetes, cardiac problems, cancers. So we're, our primary role is to screen to make sure that we are preventing these things from occurring, and, and if they are, we're catching them early. Um, dementia and uh, cognitive decline is something else that we're concerned about. So we want to screen people to make sure that they're staying active with their minds, they're not getting forgetful, and you know, encouraging them to do things to keep their mind active as well as their body active. Now, uh, I'm, I'm just curious, how do you screen people to see if they are experiencing memory loss? We have uh, specific tests that we do follow you? where we, it's um, cognition tests that we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of them are, are a couple of questions and, mm -hmm. and if they're fine with those, 
we'll just keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't do well on the first questionnaire, we go on to a more in-depth questionnaire. Okay. And then I, I have to ask you this. Um, you said that gerontology is for patients who are 65 and older. How did you, we arrive at the age of 65? What is the connection there? I'm actually not even sure. I think it's just at 65, I guess Medicare was 65 and they decided gerontology was 65 okay. and older. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, it's certainly not uh, 65 year olds. We, we have patients that we see that are in their hundreds. A lot of, we have a lot of patients that are in their 90. Mm -hmm. So certainly it's a large lifespan. Mm -hmm. There's no scientific basis for 65. It's just uh, uh, with the culture, since we become Medicare mm -hmm. uh, appropriate for 65, they, they put it like that. Okay, that's, yes. good, that's, mm -hmm. good, that's yes. good to know. Yeah. So you can be 70, 75, you're still young. I yeah. see. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. that's good to know. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Hippolyte, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about yes. uh, the role of the personal care physician because I think it is a, a very unique one mm -hmm. um, versus a specialist. So um, talk to us a little bit about what you do as a personal care physician to uh, help your patients to manage their care and help them manage their care as well? So uh, first of all, I will sit with them and ask them the quest question about if they have any problem now or why they are here to see me. And then I'll go to their past history and, and check that and make sure that there's nothing relevant that I need to take care of or uh, notice. And then if they smoke or they drink alcohol, that would be another factor that's really important to know about the patient. And then we go to their family history and uh, if they have any um, genetic related disease in their family that could affect them, they don't even know. And then uh, after that, I would check their vital signs, uh, their blood pressure and everything, and I would check them from head to toe mm -hmm. and make sure everything's okay. And then from there, I would have a care plan with them. I will sit with them and say, this is the problem that you have. That's what we can do. Either we have to do testing for that, or I can really treat you right away for, for those problems. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we go and then uh, take care of them. I and see. I'll see them again and again and make sure that everything is okay with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if or, or when your patients see specialists, yes. do you want to um, know what the specialist is doing for those patients? For example, if, if specialists order tests or et cetera, do you want to be uh, made aware of that? Yeah, of course, of course. And uh, uh, in, in my practice, in the experience I have, uh, I try to really uh, send them to the specialist when really is appropriate. If I cannot handle it anymore, I cannot solve the problems. I said, this is what you have and you need to go to the next step. We mm -hmm. need to go to the next step to get the solution for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of those patients, they understand and they agree with my plan of care. Others, they want to see several specialists. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I would tell them, you don't need it now. And can we wait and see what's going on? And then. We, if we work together, we can solve your problem, and then we go from there. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. And, and Rita, I'd, I'd like to ask you, in your experience with, with patients, um, how important is it for patients to, um, I, I'll say, share everything that, that is bothering them? You know, sometimes patients are reluctant yes. to talk about a lot of things with their physicians. Um, but that's really not helping them, is it? No, we try to get people to uh, you know, share anything that's bothering them, anything that's affecting them. Um, many people are on many different medications. We like to talk about like what the side effects of the medications can be. Uh, you know, people can feel depressed. It can actually be from the medications. They can feel, you know, so we need to know when they do go to specialists and stuff like that, that we're working with a team, as a team with a specialist, and that th where our medications are, are not going up against each other. Um, we want patients to feel comfortable telling us anything that they want to tell us and we want to make sure that we address their concerns and not, you know, if someone tells me that they're not feeling good, you know, it's, 
why aren't you feeling good? Like, someone's not feeling good doesn't help me. I need mm -hmm. to know why you're not feeling mm -hmm. good. And we try to get people to share as much as they can so we can help them. Excellent. That's important. Besides yes. the medical knowledge that we have, the experience we have, we have to build up trust with the patient. That's so yeah. important. Mm. If the patient doesn't trust you, you cannot do too mm -hmm. much for them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, that's mm -hmm. an important point. Yeah, that's thank, true. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. Uh, because I, in my own experience with my own family and friends, I know that sometimes there's been a reluctance to share everything with the physician. And I, you know, I'm always saying, but that that's not going to help you. To and and they, I think yeah. it takes time. I think, you know, after you see someone two or three times, then they come in and they tell you everything because they know that you're listening. Yes. And that's important. Yes, I appreciate that. Yes. Good points, both of you. And um, Dr. Hippolyte, I, uh, know that you are uh, the new medical director yes. for uh, Beacon of Life, and that's a PACE program. That's correct. Um, would you tell us a little bit about what that entails, and, you know, do you see patients? How often, uh, you know? It's, uh, I, I'm amazed of that program because I never knew about it before. It's, uh, there's a, a difference between what I practiced before and now, mm -hmm. because before I, I, I have, to spend like 10, 15 minutes with a patient. Time constraint, I could not see uh, so many patients I, I can do now. Now, the patient can come to me and I can spend all the time knowing what's going on with them. I have no time constraint, no space constraint. So I can see them even in the house, in the, in the nursing home, or uh, in the Bacon of Life clinic, and then take care of them. So it's a whole program of not only wellness and health, but any chronic problem they have, I can take care of it and I have the time to do that. Excellent. So, uh, the PACE program stands for all-inclusive care mm -hmm. for the patient. Mm -hmm. Not only for the medical problem, for the social problem, and if they have problem at home, like the transportation or anything like that, insurance issues, it cover everything. So the patient doesn't have to worry about anything. So, um, that sounds like a, a holistic approach. Is that's, that a good way to, to, to look yes, at it? Yes. That is wonderful. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. Excellent. We have uh, a little bit of time, a little bit uh, more than a minute to go, and um, I wanted to give both of you an opportunity to um, share any other information you'd like to with our audience about um, being a good patient, about um, the value um, of seeing a personal care physician and the value of specialist. Mm -hmm. I would just say that, um, you know, be honest with your physician and let them know what your concerns are and have them um, explain to you anything that you don't understand. And ask questions. Ask is questions, good. yes. Definitely yes, ask I a got lot that of questions. From you. Great. Yes, I, I try to make them speak. I listen carefully what they are saying and go to the uh, in depth of their problems so I can take care of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that uh, program, Bacon of Life, give me the opportunity to really spend the time with them mm -hmm. and know them uh, really deeply what's going on with them and uh, have solution for them. That's wonderful. Yes. Well, I have to tell you um, the passion and commitment uh, and the compassion yes. that you both have for patients and patient care is um, quite endearing and encouraging. So I think you've given us just a wealth of information today and thank you so very much for being my special guest and I hope at some point in the future um, we can have you back and we can continue the conversation because I think it is an important one. Thank you both so thank you. very, very thank much. You. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us today. I do hope that you've enjoyed the discussion and that you found the information useful. If you did, please share it with your family, friends, and neighbors. It has been my privilege to be your host today. Please join us for the next edition of Caregivers First. Until then, take care. Mm -hmm.